Heads up, this episode has language that might not be for everyone, so be mindful, there will be some swearing. You're listening to Code Switch. I'm B.A. Parker. I'm a film nerd through and through, especially when it comes to horror films. They're earnest in their goal to scare. It unites an audience with every bit of tension and every scream. But as a black woman, horror films can be pretty hit or miss. I mean, we tend to be the sidekick or the first to get killed. Or in the case of Freddy Krueger, we can get completely microaggressed. In 2003's Freddy vs. Jason, the last in the original Nightmare on Elm Street series, of which I was a big fan, Freddy Krueger notices Kelly Rowland of Destiny's Child, and just as she's about to get killed, he famously says, How sweet. How sweet. Dark meat. Dark meat. No! 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 Yes, Freddy Krueger is a serial killer that haunts teenagers' dreams, but I drew the line at racist. I didn't like him anymore. I don't go to horror films for realism, but some things can feel like too much. Another horror franchise that I've long been a fan of is Scream. This isn't like any other ghost face. We're currently over 25 years into the Scream universe. I mean, I've literally grown up with these movies. Hello. Let's play a game. You know you're like the 10th guy to try this, right? And with Scream 6 recently coming out, I started thinking about my relationship to these horror films and how what I've expected out of them has shifted. So I asked movie critics Mallory Yu and Richard Newby to come on the show to talk about how horror as a genre has evolved, whose nightmares we're telling, and how scary movies can actually help us empathize with each other. All right, we're all good? Yep, I'm good. All right, let's do it to it. Okay, so I promise, um, this is like a round table, so it's not just me asking questions. It can be the both of you asking questions, saying whatever you feel, like it's totally a salon. Um, Yes, so we're going to talk about horror, um, because I have a lot of... uh, questions to ask but right now first thing is i would like you both to introduce yourselves hi i'm mallory i am a producer and editor at all things considered and i love movies specifically horror hi i'm I'm richard i am a writer for the hollywood reporter in fangoria uh, and an author of a short story horror collection called we make monsters here and i am a lifelong horror fan wait do i hear Wait, do you have barking? Yeah, it's my it's my it's my dog in the in the other room. That's okay. Uh, what kind of dog is it? She's a mix. She's a mutt. Oh. Okay. What what is the first horror movie you both remember seeing? So I I will say that um I used to be a huge chicken when I was a kid. So the first horror thing that I can remember ever watching, which freaked me out, and to this day I still can't stand dolls. Um, but it was a Twilight Zone episode, that infamous <gasps> one with the evil doll. Talking Tina? Oh, yeah. My name is Talking Tina, and I'm beginning to hate you. Yes, and I saw this, like, I didn't even know what the context was. I just saw a scene from that episode, and it terrified me for so long that I couldn't really watch horror movies until basically I started dating my partner who is a huge horror movie fan and I kind of fell into the genre with her. <laughs> so um I grew up reading a lot of a lot of fairy tales so that was kind of like a natural segue into horror for me and I always loved like the darker aspects of fairy tales like the witches and the you know creepy woods and stuff so my first horror movie memories was definitely the the universal monster movies it's creepy. it was creepy but it wasn't you know uh super alarming uh, Wait, is the universal horror is that like uh frankenstein it's alive. It's alive. Oh, so like frankenstein bride of frankenstein dracula the Invisible Man. He's invisible. Let's wish the matter with him. If he gets the rest of them clothes off, we'll never catch him in a thousand years. Oh, these are classy horror movies. Classics. 
this is this is wonderful. Like like a mummy I, covered in like toilet yeah, paper. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Yours are yours are way better than mine. Mine's very anticlimactic. When I was a kid, I was scared of Batman. I had nightmares about like the Michael Keaton Batman for a very long time as a toddler. I'm Batman. I can see that for sure. Yeah. But so like I'm thinking about how if I think that Batman is scary. Like, I feel like horror could be anything. But I guess when I think about horror, I kind of anticipate gory and gruesome. When I used to used to be a film professor, the first film I would always teach at the beginning of every semester was Whiplash, the, the yes. jazz film, mm. about, the, like, the guy who was obsessed with playing the drums. Yeah. Sight read measure 101. Ba, 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 what are you, in a fucking acapella group? Play the goddamn kit! Ah. Now answer my question. Were you rushing or were you dragging? Answer! Because it's it's so tense, this relationship, and it's there's, there's a, a fair amount of dread that, that comes with that relationship. So I would teach it as a horror film, although I remembered some students found it inspirational, which was slightly <laughs> stressing. Not where you wanted that to go. <laughs> That's not where I wanted it to go. I was like, well, <laughs> all right. <laughs> I mean, if, it, if, it'll, if you'll watch it, then I'll take what I can get. But, like, with trying to define what horror is, do you feel like horror has changed over time? You know, horror, the thing that I like about it is that it's always been about metaphors and symbolism, and it's a way for us to talk about ourselves and each other. And I think that's been a constant you know, even when you go back and you look at Bram Stoker's Dracula. I am Dracula. And it's the fear of the other. You know, it's it's yep. very much a story about uh, a fear of, of, of immigrants coming in and, and changing your society. And so I think that it's really been interesting to kind of see how horror has changed along with our, our societal issues and fears and kind of what that represents and what is scary to to which audience? When I watch horror, I think about Roger Ebert's quote of movies being empathy machines. And for me, I think that, that horror is one of the best ways to feel empathy towards, you know, another person or another group of people. Um, it's which is, so which is interesting, yeah. Because, like, it, it is so often dismissed as just being about bloodletting. Monsters. And... Uh, yeah, and, and exploitation, but I think that there is so much compassion and empathy that we're allowed through experiencing someone else's fears. Yeah, because immediately you say that, and I think about Night of the Living Dead. Cooper! Cooper! George Romero? George Romero. 1968. Yeah. And... This is the first time that I've seen like POC representation in horror. Protagonist is a black male lead, and he comes to save the day. Like he is our hero, and then immediately at the very end, um, but to give you a, like a fifty-year-old spoiler, he, <laughs> he go, gets killed by the police, which is a very late '60s thing to happen, but also not that far from 2023. And I am curious, have we have we evolved much since 1968 when it comes to the POC representation in horror? I mean, I think we have. It goes back to, you know, who is being allowed to tell these stories. With Night of the Living Dead, I think that was a really, like, interesting and prescient and still relevant horror story about, you know, a Black man against basically the entire world, mm -hmm. right, a around him. You spend the whole movie following him and following his orders, watching, you know, him boss these white people around. And he manages to survive. And then at the very end, he's he's murdered. And his victory ends up being like a Pyrrhic victory. Could audiences back then have really allowed this man to live mm. at the end of this movie? Like, 
would audiences have accepted the end of this movie if he had walked triumphantly into the sunrise? We think about that ending, I sort of think about Get Out yeah. and the way that Jordan Peele sort of subverts that. You expect, as soon as you see those sirens and the lights... I mean, I told you not to go in that house. You think, oh, shoot, yeah. he is in trouble. Like, this man is in trouble because he has just seemingly killed all of these people. It was self-defense. Exactly. But he <laughs> subverts that expectation that I think horror has set up for us. And he allows his black hero to get up and walk off into the sunrise. How you find me? I'm T.S. motherfucking A. We handle shit. Despite the fact that, you know, we do have this black lead, we didn't see for, for so many decades open casting for lead characters. But I think it was really the 90s where we started seeing black characters as leads with filmmakers mm -hmm. like, like Ernest Dickerson and films like Bones and, and Demon Knight, where we're, we're actually seeing that change. And then we have Jordan Peele come in. And I feel like it just, it, it opened up the doors because... Not only is he casting a black lead, I think that he is changing the the ending that we expect for black audiences. Mm -hmm. If it's made for white audiences, I think that we would have seen the black guy get killed. And I think that there is a certain trauma porn in that and that people sometimes like to see their predisposed beliefs, I guess, shown on screen. And so I think that that's interesting, too, is that it, it takes the reality we expect and says, you know, no, this is how it, it should be, and this is what Black people want to see. I will say, I recently had a conversation with, like, an, an older Black journalist, and he was very passionate about the alternative ending that was filmed for Get Out, where Daniel Kaluuya's character is arrested and goes to prison. And that is the ending. Yeah. And he prefers that ending. And I was like, why? Why would you want that? And he's like, because it's real. I'm like, I don't go to a horror film for reality. reality. Like, Yeah. Yeah. I also think kind of going back to the idea of horror as an empathy machine, we should be moving past the idea that you must watch a character be brutally tortured and murdered or killed in order to empathize with them. You know, we can empathize with Chris and understand how messed up of a situation he just escaped from or just survived without n needing to see him die. And that may not translate necessarily into everyday life, but it is something that's been really interesting to watch in film. And partially why I think representation in film and media is so important for so many people is that it validates your existence in this country and also validates like your horrific experiences in this country and with this country. Coming up, we talk about the future of horror for people of color and I chat with Scream 6 star Jasmine Savoy Brown about Black women in the horror realm. Parker, Code Switch. And I'm talking to movie critics Mallory Yu and Richard Newby about horror movies, including Get Out, which changed the narrative we were used to in horror. Now this is where, I'm going to shift a little bit, part of me is like, was Get Out a blessing and a curse? Mm. Because Jordan Peele has essentially created a new genre of horror that people are... Um, poorly trying to replicate that is around this idea of racial trauma. So you'll get a show like Them or a movie like Antebellum. Like there is this trail that leads back to Get Out where they think they've got a bit of the, like the Get Out recipe that is racial trauma, but some part of it just doesn't feel right. With Get Out, I feel like I know that I'm the audience for that, but with the replications, I don't feel like I'm the audience for that. Yeah, I, I think, you know, part of that, uh, and I, I have very strong feelings about Antebellum. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, think, I think a lot of that comes down to the fact that 
those projects are just kind of saying like, isn't it tough? Isn't it horrible to be black in America? And that's mm-hmm. it. Like there's there's nothing else to it. And black people know that, right? We 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 live that. And I think that's the same for for any um, minority or underrepresented uh, group of people who see themselves on film. Like you know that feeling. So, you know, you don't have to show me ourselves being being brutalized and and who does that serve i feel like it serves primarily white audiences in some ways it's just it's a guilt trip but i don't think that making an audience feel guilty is the same as making them feel empathy i also think that because get out was such a a splash and it really showed a mainstream audience what horror at its best can do and what horror at its best does part of the reason why get out was so big is because it offered some sort of catharsis, right? Something that we could take past the movie. And with something like Antebellum, I think it it fails because it just stops at look at this, like you were saying, Richard. What I'm trying to say is it was still made um, and these directors were still given an opportunity to create something that maybe they would not have received before. Um, and mm-hmm. that, I think, is a blessing where we're allowed to now see films by Black creators that don't have to be the level of Get Out um, or don't have to be as socially aware. Yeah. I mean, there are so many, you know, hundreds upon hundreds of, like, not very good <laughs> horror movies mm-hmm. made by white directors. And it's like, I, I think that, you know, we can we can have a place there uh as well and you know not that anyone aims to to make like a a not great movie but like you look at so many of the movies that came out in the 80s that people you know love now and have become cult films and part of that is just because you have filmmakers just making what they wanted to make and not necessarily trying to aim for something that's going to to get an oscar nomination richard you don't understand all i want in this world is like a plethora of poc slasher films that's all i want of just like (laughs) black latino asian folks just like going at it that's all i want i love it i love it (laughs) um but i'm trying to think of a horror film that kind of splits the difference that kind of um incidentally taps into that idea of trauma but also wants to have the fun of a slasher and immediately my my mind goes to scream too yeah does that make sense Mm. um yeah because there is that pretty iconic opening sequence with Jada Pinkett Smith and Omar Epps. Like, my word. It still bangs. (laughs) Like, I'm like, keep going. No, keep going. Yeah, it's great. (laughs) (laughs) And no one's helping. Everyone's just standing and watching, watching her bleed out. I... Foolishly, I was in elementary school, and I think I convinced my mom to let me rent it. And so I watched <laughs> I watched this by myself, and remember loving that scene, but also I was too young to fully understand the mechanics behind it, like the trauma behind it, like very specific mm. things that me as an adult now, I'm like, oh, this is very... This is very intense, very... I don't know if it's in, it was intentional. Yeah, but also just the fact that, as you said, like no one is helping her, and that, that goes back to this idea of spectacle. And, and I think that there's something, whether intentional or not, really intriguing about this Black woman like walking up on a stage and looking out at this sea of white masks, just like the mob of, of whiteness that she kind of has to to gaze out upon while she's dying. Yeah. Is there is there a space for horror films about people of color that is outside of racial trauma? I think that there can there is space for that racial trauma to not be the main character, but I think it will 
always be there because that is just the society we live in. And the wonderful thing about horror is that we can take that horrific society and create something that gives us and people like us catharsis and some sort of emotional relief, whether it's just for a couple of hours or validating your experience here. I think there's space for us to focus on racial trauma and there's space for us to kind of let it be say, a background character. But I think it's always going to be there. What do you think, Richard? And I, I think it's it's relatively new still as well. Like, I think that we're, we're really still kind of just beginning to explore that racial focus. And I feel like there's still so much to say. Like, I I watched uh, yes. Uma last year with, with Sandra Oh. And, you know, it's an Asian-American horror film and it's dealing with the trauma brought on her by her mother. And I feel like, you know, those kinds of films are also, like, we're really just starting to see people's voices come through. Yeah, we've now, we've like, now stretched out to generational trauma. Yeah. We have now can, can get yeah. that into the horror mix. <laughs> yeah. There's one thing I'm, con- this is a personal concern that I have. I'm just going to, like, feel my feeling really yeah. quickly. <laughs> Of like in talking about this um, uh, aversion to racial trauma and horror, that, that that it sounds like I'm saying I don't want people's culture to be in horror. Mm-hmm. But so I think so much of like being a POC in America and our cultures involves trauma. But like once you nix that, what what can horror be? I think like one of the the ways to kind of do that without it being about racial trauma. It's like, I think that so many cultures have a rich history of folklore. And I think that that's something that also like really hasn't been tapped into. Think back to the original Hollywood horror movies and it's all pulling from, you know, this white European lore. I mean, the werewolf, the the vampire, like those are embedded in, you know, European lore. And I feel like, Every other culture has so many stories that are equal to that, if not if not superior, in terms of their ability to create fear. Uh, so that's something that I, I hope to see. Yeah, I think Guillermo mm-hmm. del Toro does this beautifully, where he just where he manages to kind of create this atmosphere of dread and you know heaviness and pressure, while also giving you an out in the fantastical horror imagery yeah. that he he gives you. Like I still think about Pan's Labyrinth and those creatures that he created, that world that he created and the way in yeah. which it was such a lovely reflection on how we tell ourselves stories to survive. Um and that's what I want to see. <laughs> that's the representation <laughs> that I have been fighting for. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful, but will also kind of ruin your day. Exactly. Just like me. (laughs) (laughs) If we can all just collectively emotionally get back to that scene in uh, Scream 2 without the murder. That's what we need. Like, just like the collective... um, Communion, <laughs> just without like a full blown homicide in the middle of it, is what is what I'm trying to find in 2023, but I don't know if I'm going to get it. Richard Mallory, thank you so much for talking with me and let me nerd out for an afternoon. Oh, this was so fun. Sure. Yeah, this was great. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So while we've moved on from Scream 2 and Jada Pinkett Smith dying in front of a theater of moviegoers, the Scream franchise is still evolving. Scream 6 recently came out, and it's trying to do something different. Jasmine Savoy Brown is one of the stars of this new take. She's a queer Black woman who's been in the last two Screams, and at least in Scream 5, they actually let her live. I love any kind of Black girl in horror. It makes me happy. We need to get you up in the next movie if there is one i don't know 
Jasmine is also the lead in the Showtime thriller horror series Yellow Jackets. She's becoming a bit of a scream queen. All right, so um, we are talking about horror films and about the Scream franchise. And I wanted to ask you, you know, as an actor in the franchise, how do you think it has evolved? I mean, personally, seeing like six brown people on the poster. That's pretty cool. I think that's one way it's evolved for sure. It's more melanated now. And not just for, you know, a couple scenes here and there. Like, we're pretty much in the movie. Proud of that. It's evolved because there's queer characters now. They're not just queer-coded. They are out and proud. Um, And, you know, what I really appreciate about the Scream franchise is it's very... It's always of the moment, Mm -hmm. but without cementing itself in that moment. That's why people still love one and two and three and four is like they reflected that time, but they're also pretty timeless. And that's fun. Yeah. I. This is a, a total weird tangent, but when I was a kid, I used to, we could only print out 15 pages at school every day when I was like in ninth grade. And I printed out the scream script. So you do 15 pages a day? Every day. And it took me like a week. Oh my God, that's so sweet. And put it in a little binder. And would, like, compare it to the movie. I was a dorky kid. Whoa. I was a film nerd, and so, like... So this podcast makes sense. This does make sense. I mean, but yeah, so I am a huge fan of Scream, of the franchise. But also, I'm just so excited to have you in it. Thank you. But, okay, with the fact that we are on Scream 6 and... Your character is like a, dis- a descendant, a descendant, like, like <laughs> the ancestors of Scream. Dude, is, is there like, do you feel beholden to the legacy of Scream when you're doing these kind of things? Um. Okay, here's the truth. I feel like I want to do right by all the fans. They're yeah. passionate and they've been committed for a long time. And we are the new iteration. Like mm-hmm. 5 wasn't called Scream 5, it was called Scream. So it's the scream for today's generation. And we are queer and we are black and we are brown. And um, it's it's scream, but it's also ours. And so we're going to do something different. And um, and if you don't want to see that, you don't have to. But you should. <laughs> you should. I mean, okay. But also, can I just give you just my personal complaint? Please. It's something that I've been waiting for for yeah. 25 years. Because when I was little, I was a big fan of Scream 2, which I feel like had all of, like, the the black folk in it. Even, like, the smart ones are like, this place is scary, I'm getting out. Right. Good night, good luck, yeah. whatever. I remember there was an original script of it where the best friend, it was Elise Neal's character, was supposed to be Ghostface. And so I was like... That would be sick. I'm waiting. I've been waiting I know, all people my want... life. I want a black... Girl, ghost face. And I mean, as if we don't <laughs> have plenty of reasons, I think it would be epic and it wouldn't be that far from reality. We could easily justify that. That's my sense of equality is when we get a black, a black female killer. Agreed. I mean, for almost 27 years, it's been the same collection of mostly white boys killing people. But a black female ghost face, that would be pretty sweet. It's not necessarily something I expect, though. Horror films rarely allow for a depth of character in black women, save for a Jordan Peele film. We're barely allowed to survive in these horror movies, let alone be the killer in one. One thing that we're trying to do with this episode, we talk about how in the post-Get Out era, there's a lot of horror films that address racial trauma. Yeah. And I'm like... Oh, boy. Right. Like, Jordan Peele does it really well. Yeah, but then people try to do Jordan Peele. And there's some people, yeah, some people should need to just sit down. Yeah. Just sit down. But I have a question about, like, how does it feel? What does, what does being a quote-unquote final girl mean to you? It means, um, it's it's such an honor, like, to get to be a part of that the final girl thing is cool, but specifically to be a queer black final girl mm-hmm. in a franchise that up until now has been pretty white, pretty straight, mm-hmm. um, is is something I don't take lightly, mo- mostly because I know that 
little girls, little boys, little people who look like me will grow up having seen that for themselves, like seen a version of themselves in me. And they, how cool is that? The Gen Z and whatever comes next is seeing us. They see you doing this podcast. They see me in this movie and this TV show and they don't have to picture it because yeah. they get to see it. I, it. It's hard for me to wrap my mind around. Yeah. You have kind of, I don't know if it's intentionally, unintentionally built this little corner of the world for yourself. This little, little oeuvre of really thoughtful horror films like i know that you have one coming up soon like yeah with you and cool. was it like is it green tatiana bank? mislani yeah green bank it'll be directed by josh rubin that's gonna be sick are you excited i'm excited i'm scared in a good way why like, are you scared in a in a way that it makes me feel alive because i think tatiana mislani is brilliant so is josh and this movie's really smart yeah um and um without giving anything away, we're being really intentional about casting because um, I have parents in this movie and I'm a mixed race woman of color. Mm-hmm. And I think any time you cast the parents of a mixed race person, it's really interesting who you choose for each role. Like it tells a really different story if my mom is white and my dad is black versus if my mom is black and my dad is white. True. Uh, but in this movie, I'm excited to be at that place in my career where I can produce or at least give heavy feedback on the things that I'm a part of. So it's not like I'm just joining something and you all get to tell the story and I'm just here, but I'm I'm also making the story. Um, that that makes me more excited, makes it scarier, makes me more proud. And it's just the beginning because I'm about to take out some projects of my own. I want to make some stuff that I have control over. Is there anything that I haven't asked that you think I should have that you want to say? What do I want to say? This is your people. platform. Hmm. <laughs> this is the masses. <laughs> to the masses, brush your teeth twice a day. Amen. And drink enough water. You got to drink half your body weight in ounces. That's what they say. Do you? Just like at least drink the same amount of water as you drink in everything else. If you have a cup of coffee, match that with a cup of water. I'm serious. That is my ender for every episode. I say hydrate. You stole my line. Sorry about that. That's okay. We're good. Jess. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You, Parker. This is a pleasure. This was lovely. Thank you. And that's our show. You can follow us on IG at NPR Code Switch. If email is more of your thing, ours is codeswitch at npr.org. And subscribe to the podcast on the NPR app or wherever you get your podcasts. And just want to give a quick shout out to our Code Switch Plus listeners. We appreciate you and thank you for being a subscriber. Subscribing to Code Switch Plus means getting to listen to all of our episodes without any sponsor breaks. And it also helps support our show. So if you love our work, please consider signing up at plus.npr.org slash codeswitch. This episode was produced by Christina Kala with help from Kamari Devarajan, Alyssa Jung Perry, and Olivia Chilcody. It was edited by Courtney Stein. Our engineer was Maggie Luthar. And a big shout out to the rest of the Code Switch Massive Dahlia Mortada, Jess Kung, Deba Modisham, James Sneed, Virlyn Williams, Steve Drummond, L.A. Johnson, Gene Demby, Lori Lizarraga, and Karen Grigsby Bates. I'm B.A. Parker. Hydrate.